Hi, I'm Alan Moravitz with Cooper Krause Hines out of the Corpus Christi, Texas field office. What we're going to be presenting today is what we call our XP demo. During our XP demo, we're going to intr introduce you into hazardous locations. What makes up a hazardous location? From there, we will get into area classification fundamentals, where we define class, division, and group. After we learn about classes and divisions and groups, we will get into protection techniques, purged systems, intrinsically safe systems, and the one that keeps us in business, explosion-proof or explosion-protected equipment. From there, we will get into equipment selection, and after we finish with equipment selection, we will get into the uh, meat and potatoes of our demo where we take propane, we ignite it with an, a spark plug as our ignition source, and set off an actual explosion. We're going to start off our discussion this afternoon with some hazardous location fundamentals. When we use the term hazardous location, we're talking about any area where we have three basic components present. That would be a fuel or combustible product, a source of ignition, and where it's mixing with air. When we have all three of those together, we have the building blocks for a hazardous location. So let's get into a little bit more detail in regards to hazardous locations. The building blocks for hazardous locations are classes, divisions, and groups. When we're talking about cl the classification of the product, we're talking about whether it's a gas, vapor, or liquid for class one. For class two locations, we're dealing with combustible dusts. And in class three locations, we're dealing with flyings and fibers. Examples of these in class one, flammable gases and vapors. Uh, refining applications, chemical plants, wastewater treatment plants. Class two locations would be grain elevators or flour mills. A class three location, flyings and fibers, would be found in a textile mill or a cotton gin. We further break down these hazardous locations into divisions. We said the class was the basic building block. The division tells us whether that flammable gas vapor or liquid or combustible dust is present under division one conditions, which means that it's normally present, or division two, where it's not normally present. An example of division one to division two, anytime you have a division one boundary around a thief hatch on an oil tank, around a flange on a valve, the, the area immediately adjacent to that division one area would be automatically classified as division two. When we get beyond the division two boundary, we get into non-hazardous locations. To further break it down into a little bit more of a sci science, we get into group designations. For uh, class one gases, vapors, and liquids, we have groups A, B, C, and D. The only member of group A would be acetylene. Uh, for group B, we have hydrogen and hydrogen-based gases. For group G C, we would have ethylene. And for group D, we would have the hydrocarbon-type gases. For class two locations, we have groups E, F, and G. Group E would be metallic dust, group F would be carbonaceous dust, and group G would be grain dust. And there are no group designations for class three flying and fiber locations. In summary, again, class one, division one and two, groups A, B, C, and D, class two, division one and two, groups E, F, and G, and then finally flying and fibers for class three. Hi, I'm Bob Potter with Cooper Krause Hines. And what we have here today is our hazardous location explosion proof kit. And what we're going to be demonstrating is a class one division one area. Class one is your flammable gases, liquids, and vapors. And division one means that the gases are present under normal operating conditions. On this side of the unit, we have a lighting fixture. And what we're going to do is fill that fixture with propane. We're demonstrating that this fixture is installed in a class one division one area and it's assumed that in the Division I area, those gases that are there under normal operating conditions will seep into our lighting fixture. So we're filling it with propane to demonstrate the gases that have seeped into the lighting fixture, and then we are going to ignite it with a spark plug so you can see how the fixture contains the explosion. Okay, now we're gonna ignite the gas that's inside the fixture. That fixture just contained an explosion. You saw the blue flash inside the fixture. The fixture did what it's supposed to do, contain the explosion, cool the hot gases, and then harmlessly release those cool gases back out to the atmosphere. Now, on this side of the unit, 
I have a fitting, and I also have a cylinder. Here we're representing the class one, division one area, and that's what this cylinder is, our production area, our area that has the gases present under normal operating conditions. The fitting inside can represent any particular product that is going to be in that particular area. It can represent a fitting, it can represent a lighting fixture, it can also represent a explosion proof motor starter. So we're going to fill the, both the fitting with gas and we're also filling the cylinder with gas. Does anybody want to take a gander if my lamp still works? Yes. It'd be a maintenance nightmare if every time you had a fixture contained an explosion, if you had to change the lamp. That's for a couple reasons. One, when the fixture contains the explosion, it's equal pressure around the lamp. Kind of like if you push on the top and the bottom of an egg, supposedly you can't break it. We're not going to demonstrate that today. Not that I'm that strong that I could break the egg. It would just be my luck that I'd have yolk all over me. But also, as we mentioned, the fixture contains the explosion, cools the gases, and then releases them back out to the atmosphere. So all the pressure is not going on the lamp. It's also moving away from the lamp. OK. Now we're going to ignite the gas that's inside the fitting. The same explosion that we had just seen in the lighting fixture happened inside the fitting, except that the fitting contained the explosion, cooled the gases, and released them back out to the atmosphere. Now, if the gases weren't properly cooled, and if the propagation was not extinguished, we would have had an explosion. It's very important to maintain and install the property the products properly. You need to have five fully engaged threads, or you need to have all flanges free and clear dirt. What we're going to do now is demonstrate something that has not been either maintenance or installed properly. Instead of having the five fully engaged threads, we're going to have just one engaged thread. Okay, now we're going to start off again by igniting the gas that's in the fitting. That's why maintenance and installation is so important. Why you get a dramatic effect seeing it here on this demonstration kit, you can only imagine if that type of situation happened in a room that's a larger size room or in a whole production facility. And that's why it's so important to keep the integrity and maintenance and installation proper of the equipment. Thank you. What I want to discuss with you is one of our most valuable selling tools, the Krauss Heinz Code Digest. The Krauss Heinz Code Digest is a reprint of Chapter 5 of the National Electrical Code, the Hazardous Location Articles. You're going to find in this particular book red writing. The red writing is word for word for the National Electrical Code. The black writing is our own terminologies, definitions, explanations, try and help the code come to life a little bit. You'll also find numerous pictorials and drawing examples in this particular book along with NFPA documents. This book is a tremendous reference tool in order to keep compliance and wire and install your electrical products properly in the use of hazardous location areas.